Hi, good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. Here. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, we are a webinar, a webcast, an online show. Um, that terminology is up for discussion amongst the people that do these kind of things. Um, but whatever you want to call us, whatever you're, you put us in do, um, we are live here every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record our shows every week and post them onto our website afterwards. And I will show you that at the end of today's show where you can see all our recordings and, um, and watch them later. Uh, both the show, the live show, and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with any of your colleagues, friends, family, anybody you might know who might be interested in any of our topics. Uh, send them to our website. They can sign up for our live sessions or um, watch any of our recordings. And we do have our recordings from um, all the way going back to when we first started the show in uh, January 2009. So there's a lot of old stuff on there, yes. <laughs> Many things that would be considered out of date or no longer relevant, um, but we just keep everything out there for archival purposes, so do keep that in mind when you're looking at some of the older shows. They might be a little, um, you know, have information that have changed or things like that. Um, we do a, a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, um, demos of things. Um, basically, our only criteria is that it's somehow library related. So something that libraries are doing, uh, something that could be of interest to libraries, some new services or products that we wanted to show you how they work. Um, so. Uh, pretty broad. Um, you'll see some things that might not sound like they have anything to do with libraries, but that's a little, you know, think outside the box. Trust us. Watch the show. <laughs> watch the recording. Everything gets connected to libraries somehow <laughs> in the end. Um, we have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff here. Um, we are the host of the show that do sessions sometimes. But we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning. To my left is uh, Marvel Maring, who is from the Omaha Public Library, just north of Lincoln here. And um, you're, it says I've got you the branch manager at one of the specific of the libraries. Yeah, the South you're, Omaha South Library. Omaha, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. They have multiple branches up there in Omaha. And um, she's going to talk to us this morning about coding with kids in the library, which is very fun. We've had um, lots of different shows um, about this from different angles and uh, different uh, programs and robotics and all sorts of things. Um, but this is one that we have not had anything on about during these specific coding events like you guys have done at Omaha Public. So um, she's going to tell us all about that this morning. So I'll just hand over to you to Great. go ahead and take it away and tell Thank us what you, you guys so are much. doing up there. OK. Uh, you might have the mouse to get. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for letting me be here today to talk about coding. This is something that's really exciting for me. I've enjoyed being a part of a coding initiative at the Omaha Public Library. And two and a half years ago, I knew nothing about computer coding. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to talk today about some initiatives that we were involved in at the Abrahams branch, which was the branch that I started at, at, at the Omaha Public Library three years ago. I just recently moved to the South Omaha Library, um, and they're very different branches, so I'll talk a little bit about mm -hmm. um, some of the unique aspects of, of working with your particular community in coding. How this began, in the fall of 2014, the Sage family, out of the blue, gave us a check for $10,000. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, we were stunned and so grateful um, for their generosity. And they told us we could use it any way we choose. So we thought um, long and hard about what would be the most um, a meaningful way to spend the money and we had we had several ideas um, one of the ideas that we were thinking about was an aquaponic oh. garden because mm -hmm. our um, if you've been to the Abrahams branch or are familiar with it it has a beautiful window oh, yeah. um, that's a lot an entire of real natural light coming exactly, in there. Yes. an entire mm -hmm. wall of, of, of window um, and as we kind of started thinking about it, there were some other funds that we were going to be able to use for gardening projects. And so the director said, Let, let's come up with another idea. So um, as I started doing a little bit of research, I thought, you know, we really do need to be offering coding at our library. So that's how we came to the idea. And my service area, when I worked at the Abrahams branch, it's very diverse, racially and economically. Um, educationally, it's also diverse. There are many traditionally schooled kids and then many, many homeschoolers. Um, 
that was a, an audience that we really wanted to tap into. And we also have a significant number of families that don't have access to the internet. So there's some growing poverty in our in that service area that we needed to be able to address. The branch that I'm at now is in the South Omaha, it's the South Omaha Library. Um, it's a unique um, library because it's also a hybrid academic and public library. We share the space with the Metro Metropolitan Community College. Mm -hmm. um, it's also in uh, an area of town that's um, primarily Hispanic with a great um, many uh, refugees and immigrants that have settled in that, in that um, area. Um, there's also um, a significant number of families without internet. Um, there's, and there's also significant poverty and crime. A lot of gang activity, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So when we thought about coding, it was like, why coding? And Anthony Cuth Cuthbertson says this about coding. Code powers our digital world. Every website, smartphone app, computer program, calculator, and even microwaves relies on code in order to operate. This makes coders the architects and builders of the digital age. In other parts of the world, coding is actually considered a new literacy, and it's mm -hmm. um, in Britain and Estonia. Estonia, it coding is compulsory in in public in the public school system, yes. and Singapore is also um, going to follow in that direction. But in the United States, it still remains marginalized through um, the K-12 education system, and a few statistics here. Only one in four schools in the U.S. teach computer science. Only 5% of high schools in the United States offer advanced placement in computer science. And only 32 states allow students to count computer science towards high school graduation. This last statistic actually did improve um, over um, in the last year. Um, so that's, that's, that's good to know. Uh, surprisingly, Arkansas is one of the leaders in mandating computer coding in the K through 12 classroom, and it actually beats out California and New York. So mm -hmm. they have a requirement that all public and charter high schools offer computer science. It's not mandatory, um, or it's, the kids are not required to take them, but it, um, it is available. It's so strange hearing these statistics. I remember when I was in I think it would have been junior high school, which is a long time ago, in the 80s. I took a computer coding class. I did. We did a thing that was, yeah. and I, I don't, obviously, I don't think it was requ required, but I took some sort of class, and I remember coding and designing um, some sort of animated stuff wow. on the screen, like very 8-bit type looking right. stuff. But it was a, a class that we were able to take way back then. Um, so I actually, I've heard this is something I do know that this is that it's not, and a lot of places aren't doing it. And I find it very strange that, that at some point it was becoming big. That I don't know if it was the beginning of stuff like the gaming, and you know Atari and things were coming out, and so they were like, oh, let's latch onto that, and then maybe it faded away. It's I think that's yeah, absolutely yeah. right. From what I've heard from my friends that are encoding, um, it's our. Um, are the number of graduates that we're putting out into the workforce and um, is is less than it was like ten years, years ago. Yeah. Um, and I'm not There's quite sure lot. why. Yeah. And according to the National Science Foundation, fewer computer science majors um, than ten years ago. Um, and that percentage is shrinking for women, which is really sad. Um, and there are currently 525,293 open computing jobs nationwide, and we only graduated 42,969 students into the workforce. Um, and that's kind of a recent statistic, too, from code.org. And of course, unfortunately, um, women, African Americans, Hispanic Americans are vastly underrepresented in the pool of candidates, making them unable to take advantage of the opportunity to ex access the best paying jobs in the country. And there are quite a few reasons for the lack of uh, computer science education. Um, sometimes just it's not a priority or there may not be funding. Some teachers feel that there's not enough um, training for pre-service and in-service teachers to feel confident doing it. Mm -hmm. And then many people um, speak about the demands of teaching the common core, and um, there just simply isn't time at the end of the day. 
But there are really important reasons why um, we should be teaching coding. And um, this is important for kids, even if they don't choose to go on and become a computer scientist. It pre prepares them to understand the world in which we live. And learning to code helps students with critical thinking, logic, math, and computational skills. And Dan Crow says this about um, computational thinking. He says, computational thinking teaches you how to tackle large problems by breaking them down into a sequence of smaller, more manageable problems. But libraries can help bridge this gap. And there are many ways that you can offer coding experiences at your library. Um, two of the websites that I have been relying on a lot are Code Academy and Code.org. Um, EdSurge is also uh, an important site to go um, investigate. There are many um, educational toys and um, games and different kinds of products that can be accessed either through the web for free or with little or no money. Um, and I have a handout that I'll share at the end that has um, many of these listed. I like the Code Academy ones. They have a lot of like the um, the hour of code. Where exactly. you, all you got to do is spend an hour of time to learn something. Yeah. And so it's like what he was just describing, written, broken up into little pieces. Um, and I actually did a few years ago. I committed to learning one little thing there to go through a, a program. So it was nice. It's yeah. Our code is. I'll talk mm -hmm. about that later too because our code is a great way to start. It's mm -hmm. it's like a manageable, um, a, a manageable amount of commitment and time and and knowledge that's required of the librarian or um, staff member who's who's offering it. So that's mm -hmm. an excellent yeah. thing. Less uh, scary than some of them. Exactly. Because <laughs> learning, learning, learning programming can just, you know, if you know programmers or see what they talk about, it can just like freeze up your brain. Like, nope, nope, can't even wrap my my head around what's, what they're doing. But this is just small little things. You learn a little bit, and you just become less scared of it. Exactly. What I and it's so it. much yeah. fun, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, with dedicated funding, with this $10,000, what we decided to do was purchase 12 Chromebooks and a charging cabinet. And then we hired several people that are prominent in the Omaha area. Shauna Dorsey, who is the co-founder of Interface Web School, one of the two coding schools in Omaha. And then Dr. Victor Winter, who is a computer science professor from UNO. And I was uh, an academic librarian at UNO for nine years, and Dr. Um, um, Winter was one of my colleagues on many committees and so forth. So I, when I found out that we had this opportunity to, to get involved in coding, he was the first person that I contacted. And I think that's going to be um, a message that I try to um, um, embed throughout this presentation is really take advantage of the tech people in your community because mm -hmm. they're a gold mine of other people who want to help with these kinds of initiatives. So um, once we found Shauna and Victor, we were sort of moving. That, we, that really sort of um, got us going in the right direction. Um, and another thing that we're doing right now also in the system is purchasing games and kits that we can um, circulate throughout the 12 branches at, at OPL. Um, and like I said, the key to our success was to have um, experts in the community who can, can be of support. We uh, consulted with Shauna and Victor about what kind of Chromebook to buy, what kind of testing we needed to do to make sure that we were getting um, the, the, the most mileage out of our, um, our spending. Um, and so they were great at kind of directing us to some, obviously compute, um, Chromebooks are much less expensive than laptops and we found that they worked just fine and they were able, we were able to uh, make a good investment with and still have some money left to um, do some other sorts of programming with our, with our $10,000. And it was also really important um, at the Abrahams branch, what I did was just simply talk to families and kids about coding all the time. In fact, the coding initiatives that we were involved in at Abrahams, we never promoted on our calendar because we knew that the demand would be so great that we would have a waiting list so, probably yeah. um, a year long. And so we kind of were just, as we were testing it, we just kind of, um, 
got the word out um, through word of mouth with all of our, our patrons. Um, we invited a lot of experts to come talk at our branch and talk about the value of coding. Um, we hosted some programs for adults, um, including area teachers, so that they could understand what their children and students would, would be doing. And what we started with, um, we had several multi-session classes um, with Shauna Dorsey, and from four, anywhere from four week to two week, um, two to four hours on a Sunday afternoon, and the kids were learning the basics of primarily HTML. They also learned jQuery, CSS, and something else, and now it's escaping me, but those were the main things that the kids were working on. We also had a lock-in um, one night and had a four-hour um, coding lock-in, and the kids worked on HTML. And just recently, this past year, we launched our first Girls Who Code Club in Omaha. Um, it's the, it was the first um, Girls Who Code Club in the entire city of Omaha, and um, only the second one in Nebraska. Lincoln beat us by a couple of weeks um, <laughs> to it, but uh, we launched a Girls Who Code Club, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, and here are some um, pictures of some of the uh, classes with the kids that uh, Shauna Dorsey taught. And you can see how there are some really tiny ones in there. There's a six-year-old. One of the kids with a um, kind of at the front with the curly hair is wow. just six years old. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I loved that Shauna did is they had they also had to do presentations. So they had to research what HTML was, what CSS mm -hmm. was, what jQuery was, and then they had to present it to the class. So it was kids are really uh, learning a lot when they're um, getting involved in code. Here's another class. This was an all-girl class, the first one that we offered. And the adorable little girl with the barrettes was also just six years old. Uh, and as long as they can sort of maneuver the keypad or a mouse, they mm -hmm. can do it. Now, I wanted to kind of highlight for a, a moment some of the work that Dr. Victor Winter has been involved in, and this has been developing over the last several years, and it's a program called Bricklayer. And Dr. Victor Winter also teaches, he has young children, um, they're about 7 and 10, and he's been running a code, uh, kids coding club in, out of his home for several years now. And what he has developed is very, it's really fascinating. It is... Oops. Should I right click? I think just double click. Yeah. We'll see if it. Oh, oh, it's in. Yeah, go ahead and say yes and go to it. Anyway. Okay. Here we go. Um, so this is a 19 module class that is based on Lego, and. Uh, Oh, Minecraft, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. and so the kids go in and work. Um, they actually begin with building Lego model, literally building Lego models, and then they go in and uh, start coding what they built. So, and then they usually have some sort of an exhibit that also accompanies the the final product. So they're really dealing with sort of the full steam kind of initiative. So including the visual arts as well as science, technology, engineering, and math. And this is something that um, he has made um, available um, on the web and has been a, an ongoing project with, with uh, he and his wife who, who both run the program. So if you want to investigate the curriculum and a little bit more, uh, feel free to, to, to do so. And uh, as I said, this is a 19-module program, and kids love it. Um, the whole Lego component, I think, is um, very engaging and captivating, mm -hmm. and they can sort of see a visual, physical, tangible thing, mm -hmm. and then move it into a digital world. I like the connecting, going from STEAM rather than STEM. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if anyone you can explain the difference between those. Two yeah, things. STEAM. I like that they're going towards some some groups and, and programs and are going towards the STEAM. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're not familiar, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And more recently, they've added the the A to include arts. Right. Um, so sort of including the, the visual aspect of um, 
of, of these experiences. Because a lot of those more science-based things are really art work or can be create. They're creative. They're, they're being creative as well. Exactly. And some people said, that's art. Why can't we just say it? And so I said, well, it's steam now. Cool. Exactly. <laughs> I love that too. Mm -hmm. Um, and if the folks that live here in Nebraska may be familiar with Do Space, which is a new technology library in Omaha, um, and they're going to, um, they've been working with, with Victor, um, and they're, at the Do Space, there are 3D printers, and so one of the ideas was that the kids could also literally build the print the stuff um, that, in a they 3D actually the, yeah. that they actually created in that they could actually create in the bricklayer program. Mm -hmm. So it's a an interesting mm -hmm. development that we're yeah. able to uh, take part. I in like making space. that connection from the the in the computer to the actual um, you know hands on um, thing. It, and what's exactly. great with the 3D printing now, you know, when it first came out very expensive but 3d printers are getting more um they're still you know hundreds of dollars but a lot more um cost effective they're a lot cheaper now exactly than they used to be so many other places may be able to get into that themselves as well just a few hundred dollars or something from a grant or a donation to get a 3d printer into your library to be able to, to do something like that to yeah. translate what's on it's, the screen to an actual this is what i made this is, yeah <laughs> there's something about that whole full circle of mm. um like having it in your mind and then it manifesting into something 2D and then 3D and then to the digital world, it's pretty fascinating. And this is the, an example of the kind of artifact that, that the kids might build in Bricklayer. And now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, our first Girls Who Code Club chapter in Omaha. And again, Shauna, who's been my cohort um, throughout this entire two and a half years, she and I met with two other coding women, Sandy Barr, who is our uh, the founder of the Omaha Coding Women, and then Lana Yeager, who's the computer science teacher at South High School in Omaha. We all met and uh, uh, got together and applied for a Girls Who Code club. Um, some of the requirements for that um, include having a stable technological infrastructure, uh, sufficient volunteers and teachers, um, and a site host. So this past February, we held information sessions to recruit girls, and they were between 6th and 12th grade who could participate in this chapter of uh, Girls Who Code. Um, it's a very competitive process. Uh, the girls had to write three essays that were judged um, by a team of people, uh, and then they were required to partake in a, a group interview. And uh, the group interview involved actually solving a coding problem together. And so they spent about three hours with other girls in the group. And so they were sort of judged also on how well they worked as a team and how well they communicated with one another and and that sort of thing. Um, we launched a 20-week, two-hour-per-week session of Girls Who Code this past March. Uh, it just ended at the end of July. Um, and we had 12 6th to 9th grade girls in one uh, group and then 12 10th through 12th grade girls. And Girls Who Code requires 40 contact hours per, per uh, session in order to graduate. Um, and this uh, was a second Girls Who Code club in Nebraska, as I mentioned. Lincoln uh, beat us just by a couple of weeks. And there are many advantages to setting up a Girls Who Code club. And um, they include uh, the curriculum, which is provided, and um, uh, all the kinks are sort of worked out. We also had great support from the New York City office. Um, if you're not familiar, Girls Who Code is a national organization. Um, so um, you apply to, to, uh, to have a code club um, um, chapter in your community. Um, and there are also a lot of Girls Who Code community resources that we could tap into. That's great. I'm sure a lot of places are thinking, how do I even begin doing this? Um, and you don't have to do it from scratch. <laughs> exactly. It's already exactly. Out there for you. Yeah. And just by finding uh, Shauna and Sandy and Lana, we, um, we you know, it, it kind of it came from that. It was just a very organic, easy process um, 
to fill out the application wasn't completely onerous. We did it in a probably in about an hour and a half, um, and uh, we just waited for a while. It took about six weeks for us to get um, to find out if we if our application had been accepted, mm -hmm. and then after Christmas um, we moved forward and offered these information sessions, and then launched our club our club in March. These are a couple of our girls. Um, these are both sixth graders. And the little girl on the right, she's actually using one of our um, uh, Chromebooks that is Wi-Fi enabled. Mm -hmm. So she can ch she could check that out and take it home with her um, and have Wi-Fi, um, even though she didn't have Wi-Fi in her home. Mm -hmm. And this is the girls at work. This is the young group. These are the sixth through uh, ninth or uh, sixth through eighth grade. These are the older girls. And one thing I loved about watching the girls who code is every beginning session they would sit in a circle and talk about whatever issues they were dealing with that week when it came to coding um, and, and a problem that they couldn't solve. And what they started to realize was that coding is all about failure, but it's <laughs> all about mm -hmm. like learning from failure and not giving up and being sort of... Um, um, stubborn and persistent and um, and they also learned from all of the computer programmers who were teachers that that's exactly what they experience every single day too in their own life and so there was a there were a lot of sort of life lessons about just being um, just being engaged and not giving up and being resilient and dealing with um, um, the, the things that don't go right and the frustrations. They also had lots of opportunities to present to the group. So they did almost every other week there was some sort of group that was doing a presentation. So they were learning to work as a team and to um, build their presentation skills. Here are the groups working on their final projects, and the the about the last third of the of the girls who code sessions um, were devoted to the girls working on their final projects, and so they came up with whatever their um, collective final project was, and it, so it was in each final project was a group project. So the 12 girls on each um, team worked on a project. And they literally started building it from the, the ground up. Here they are doing presentations again and showing a little bit of the code that they were writing. Here's the young group. They also brought in guest speakers about every two or three weeks. So there were women who are actively involved in a coding uh, profession, in some sort of computer science profession in the city that would come and meet the girls and talk about their experience. Um, so the girls were gaining a lot of professional experience, just sort of learning about the variety of ways you can apply computer science in the work world. And it really did take a village. When, when we got started, I was not at all sh sure how we were going to be able to offer um, coding without paying exorbitant amounts of money to, for our speakers. And literally, Shauna um, sort of sat me down and said, don't worry, I will find people. And there will be people coming out of the woodwork that want to be a part of this. <laughs> and so we had 17 volunteers who helped with everything. So they helped TA the classes. They helped um, organize other volunteers, um, the guest speakers. They provided snacks. They helped plan the graduation party. And we actually spent um, nothing on the Girls Who Code Club. Not one penny from nice. our library budget. The only initial investment was the Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the Girls Who, Clo who Code, um, uh, that those opportunities are expanding in Omaha. In, um, there's going to be a, a Girls Who Code Club starting September 25th at Dew Space. Um, Shauna Dorsey's been working with um, principals all across Omaha Public School System to get as many 
uh, Girls Who Code clubs started in, in as many schools as possible. And then Abraham's, my former branch, is um, offering their second session starting in September. And that'll be a 10-week session for four hours at a time. So the, it's going to be a little more compacted and longer, longer work time. And what we learned about all the coding activities is you've got to get out in the tech community and start networking. That's really um, the key to your success. Don't feel like you have to do this on your own. Um, I mean, I don't know anything about coding beyond um, participating in an hour of code myself. So this is not my um, educational background. But you will find support. Um, we had support from uh, local tech businesses. Um, once people learn about Girls Who Code, the women in coding across the city were really eager to participate. We had to actually turn people away. There were so many volunteers. <laughs> I didn't think it nice. would be possible, but and but it was true. Like we had, and we have such growing support for Girls Who Code. And for many, uh, um, for many folks, this may not this 10 to 20 week sort of session um, structure may not work for everyone. So if there are, um, if you want to just try some simple kind of one and done coding activities, these links um, will give you a lot of um, examples of very simple um, uh, coding activities that you can take. Um, take advantage of in your own library setting and offer on a you know a two hour um, after school or Saturday or Sunday program uh, and that often is the way to kind of get kids um, initially interested or sometimes it also can be something that families do together a parent and a child or that kind of thing and future plans at the Omaha Public Library um, one of the things we're really interested in doing is 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 putting the bricklayer program in that 19 module uh, um, structure <clears throat> course from Victor Winter, putting that into uh, um, a weekly coding opportunity at Abraham's. Um, we also have wanted to work with the UNO computer science students who can um, help tutor our coding club kids. Oftentimes, if there's community engagement um, opportunities at a university, this is one way that um, a partnership could be forged. Um, at the branch that I'm at now, we're trying. We have a lot of at-risk teens uh, at our branch, and we're trying to figure out ways to offer um, those kids some regular coding um, events. And about the branch that I'm at now, um, the teen population primarily is boys. It's probably about 90% boys who come on a regular basis. So. When, when I moved to the branch, I thought, I'm going to immediately get a Girls Who Code Club um, set up. The first um, fall that I'm there, I wanted to have this September launch another Girls Who Code Club. And I got there and I realized this is a totally different demographic. It's not always a one-size-fits-all. Um, mm -hmm. It's important to kind of just learn your community and figure out what's going to work best. And so um, through Shauna Dorsey, um, and I, again, that whole networking thing is so important, I asked her if she knew anyone in the community that might help us with at working with at-risk boys and there's a, a young man um, a gentleman who graduated from interface web school um, one of the coding schools in Omaha who has been working with at-risk youth in North Omaha and if you're not familiar North Omaha um, is a predominantly african-american section of, of Omaha and unfortunately is plagued by a significant amount of crime and poverty um, but uh, this individual has been working with a group of at-risk teens um, all summer long um, in a program called the Highlander program and the kids have been doing web development and it's been kind of an, a, an astounding <clears throat> project and so we've been working with him um, we're, our plan is that we want to do something similar at South and we're going to take our time this fall to kind of um, lay out um, what's going to work best and we hope to launch something in January. And like I said, one size doesn't always fit all, so mm -hmm. take time to learn your community and see what 
uh, what might work best. And that's a good tip for anything you do. Exactly, <laughs> like for, exactly. Like, treat this just like any other program. You wouldn't just throw something out there because it's a new cool thing. You exactly. can figure out what is your community need, what are, who's coming in, who, who's not coming in that might need this, and tailor it to them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, another way to offer easy and inexpensive ways um, for coding is um, there are many games and kits and toys that are out there uh, that don't cost a lot of money. Um, you can also share staff and expertise across your library system or across your geographic re region. We have several uh, folks in the Omaha Public Library that are um, particularly keen on uh, technology and introducing that to to kids and teens. So we have um, we had kind of a, a task force that that got together in the last um, several months. Um, and we looked at the ways that we could be offering coding across the system and how we could support one another in our coding initiatives. Um, so sometimes it's a matter of just sort of pooling your resources, the people in your system that are um, excited about this and eager to, to offer opportunities and tap into that. And finally, um, hosting an hour of code, as Krista mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, it's such a great way to get kids started and if you haven't participated in an hour of code I highly recommend that you do so I did it mm -hmm. and like I said I know nothing about coding and I was riveted I couldn't I mean I didn't want to like I didn't want to stop <laughs> yeah. Keep going on to the next one and the next yeah one. <laughs> it gets harder and harder and it's like very um, very interesting and I would love to see all the Nebraska um, libraries getting involved in offering an hour of code. Coordinate something, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to sort of share this little. Oh. Whoops. And let's turn the volume up on that too. There we go. Whoops. What did I just do? Ah. Here, trying to hit escape to get out of that. Get back to what I'm doing. Here we go. Let's change the volume a bit so you can make sure you can catch it so the volume's at. That's all right, okay. Uh, oh wait, this is sorry, this is not this is not the one that I want to show. Let me pull the one up from I think I have. Here we go. This is one. That's when you said it before, yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean to do that, did I? No, it's okay. They spend so much time using the largest education events in history. For another set, what they call an ambitious goal for reaching 10 million students this year. Almost 15 million signed. You can hear it better now. There we to show kids what it takes to create the programs and apps they spend so much time using. The largest education events in history. We're going to set what they call an the ambitious goal of reaching 10 million students this week. Almost 15 million signed up. This week, I'm proud to join the students, teachers, businesses, and nonprofit organizations taking new steps to support computer science in American schools. You guys are already getting a head start on taking over the world. Oh my God. They've been so excited about it. They don't even have to be a computer science engineer. Maybe they want to do something else. But in our world, this is going to be 
the basis for everything that we do. When you're building a program, you have to think outside of the box. If you can change technology, you can change the world. I challenge girls in every single country to learn one hour of more. Every district should do, every district can do it. Please help us get the hour of code to every school, in every classroom, and every child. And I schools do it. Escape it. Oops. Anyway, oh, whoops. There we go. Yeah. There we go. And actually, you might want to close that one because it's going to go on to the next video, oh, but automatically, potentially. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. As you can see, I'm not the most technologically um, facile. Um, and I provided here, too, some PDFs that if you're trying to uh, make a case for um, your your library to li your library director or to a board or what have you about why you should be offering coding and the value to your community. There's a, a bibliography here of some important articles that talk about coding being sort of a, a core um, literacy and why we should be um, offering that. And we'll provide these in the show notes afterwards at, when the recording is up. We'll have links to these two PDFs so you can get the documents yourself. Uh, to, to refer to and use. And then this is um, from EdSurge, um, which was uh, a resource I mentioned earlier. If you're interested in finding out about different kinds of games and uh, um, products or uh, resources on the web, um, what have you, all different kinds of things um, dealing with coding, you'll see, I think this is uh, 17 pages long. Um, so lots and lots of things that you can investigate that are either free or um, a relatively modest cost um, that you can introduce at your own library um, uh, setting. And that is um, all I have. <laughs> all right, great. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, type them in using your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface, or if you have a microphone, just say, I have a microphone, please unmute me. You can ask your question that way. Um, we did have one comment. We were talking about the STEAM versus STEM. Uh, um, someone did say, George Lucas says that arts comes first. Arts come first. The idea comes first, and then technology is developed to create the art. Oh, excellent. So he's saying it's actually the opposite. Yeah. You know? um, she says not exact words, but that's the gist of what he has, has said. So um, using the, you know, get your creative people who wouldn't maybe think about that coding or computers or something is something I'd work, I would use, and they will get in here and, and like that video, get excited about, look what I made, it's exactly. so pretty. I mean, exactly. that, it wasn't, this is technology, it's, it's pretty, I made it, oh my god. Exactly. I created this myself. <laughs> um, that was great, yeah. Uh, the, this programs and things that are going on with this, I think, are just great. I wish they'd be more, yeah, getting more of the kids involved in it. And obviously, the girls who are having, you know, there's less of us in the in the field, which is not we need to get up there, get more in there. Um, all right, we do have a question that came up. Um, after the girls graduate, I assume from the, the girls who code, can they still be involved? Are there continuing yes. activities for them to advance even more, like once they get beyond the girls who code? Yes, that's an excellent question. That? Yes, they can participate um, until, they grow, until they actually graduate from high school. So yes. say a girl starts in sixth grade, she can continue on and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and because there are different levels that you can uh, move through at your own pace, even through a say through our 20 week session, some girls got to a certain say they got to level two, but there might have been some girls that got to level four. Mm -hmm. um, so they can keep going. And then often those girls who have gone through one session can then be sort of student ambassadors for oh, the sure. following sessions. Mm -hmm. And so they help each other and start they can helping. mentor the younger kids coming exactly. into the, for the first time. Yeah. And so there are many girls, many of the girls that we worked with are continuing on next in this next um, uh, iteration mm -hmm. of it. 
And this would also be something that if you know they start with the Girls Who Code Club or whatever the coding events you have at the library, and then they could move on to the the programs, the schools in in Omaha, the web school and everything, and the mm -hmm. Women Who Code or it, UNO. Exactly. <laughs> um, that would be something to move them on to as well. You know, you start out with this smaller, younger group here in the library, but now you've got this other place that you can move on to and advance. And those yeah. all of the people that served as volunteers are coding women in Omaha. And so mm -hmm. they have the girls in the Girls Who Code Club have these mentors now in the city that they can um, they can touch base with and ask questions of and mm -hmm. learn more about the specific ways that women are coding um, mm -hmm. because it's it I think the women are making a real difference in the kinds of things they code like mm -hmm. I know when I had a conversation with Lana Yeager who's the uh, Omaha South um, computer science teacher she has she got permission to teach an all-girl um, computer science class in her high school, nice. which is sometimes difficult mm -hmm. to get that kind of permission when you're excluding another group right. of, of kids. Um, but the girl, one of the girls, designed an app that addressed domestic violence, mm -hmm. and if you were in an unhealthy relationship, and nice. um, it's, I think that's just fascinating that 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 would be. The topic that I mean, it's an unfortunate topic, but it's a relevant topic for young girls. And I don't know if that would have been something that would have ever crossed the mind of a young boy, yeah. you know, a high school boy. So when we have the opportunity, when women have an opportunity to build apps and um, and make technological um, um, breakthroughs in in the kinds of things that they're coding that can change the whole um, complexion of what you see out in the in the world mm -hmm. it isn't um, um, so sort of male dominated in the in the perspective so I think that's important yeah absolutely um, oh and well and here comes the question you want, is there a similar group for boys you know is there, there is something like that would be specific for them as a group um, you know that's one thing that when I got to South I'm like what am I going to do with these boys who um, um, need sort of to direct their energy into something productive and positive um, they're there isn't something specific nationwide I think because they I think there's an assumption that it is so male dominated that the boys are going to be um, feeling they'll feel more comfortable in their own high schools if they're mm -hmm. offering computer science. Um, I mean, there may I can investigate that. I'm not positive that there's not something out there, but I know Girls Who Code was established to address the gender gap. That there was a lacking in that area, yeah, or because the 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 profession itself is is historically male dominated they are more comfortable going into that field than the girls are mm -hmm. so that's why they need exactly. the extra help um, but I can get I can understand the questions that you created this girls who code and, and you've gone the opposite direction where you've now excluded the boys from something mm -hmm. so um, they may they now suddenly may feel left out <clears throat> you know it's funny but you can have I mean you could have two you could have you could you could just you do a boys one and so here's the boys or and do a mixture and then let the kids decide you know which group they want to become a part of and participate in you know do some that are not specific for a, a specific group I mean the hour of code and a lot of these other ones are not that exactly. kind of a thing they're just for anybody so. exactly you know it's funny because sometimes and this is just anecdotal but in my teen room when I go in and ask the kids the boys primarily because there are about mostly 90 percent boys that, that hang out at our library I ask them if they'll if they'd be interested in um, uh, doing any kind of coding workshops and there's a little bit of bravado like oh yeah I know that already I'm already an expert you know and they're 14 years old and it's um, like well um, and I think that sometimes that's what my friend uh, Lana Yeager deals with when she's at her Omaha South High School in her classes that sometimes the girls are open and curious and not um, overly confident mm -hmm. but they grow in their level of confidence but sometimes the boys think they know more than they actually do I think because they're they're mm -hmm. consumers of games and, and and they spend a lot of time on div digital devices mm -hmm. that they think their own level of they don't need to learn exactly they don't need that to they're already there programs or classes yeah. 
so there's a little clubs, of that that yeah. you have to overcome kind of a um that i'm that i've mm -hmm. kind of experienced already in just the short time i've been at south but what we're hoping to do in terms of addressing the boys that are kind of at risk we're going to see if we can find That's a, a whole donor other I, a whole other issue there. Yeah, yeah we want to see area. if we can find a donor who might be sympathetic to that cause and then sort of create, build some kind of um, program. And one thing we'd like to do is have kind of something similar to Girls Who Code um, where we provide a meal at um, each session and have um, uh, role models in the community. Um, people of color who are involved in coding and all different kinds of, to give the kids sort of a perspective that there are some opportunities for them that mm -hmm. um, when they uh, pursue this and and stick to it, that there are ways that they can really grow. Yeah, and keep going with it, absolutely. Um, any other questions, type them in. we still got about five minutes left if you want to ask anything else or get more information. Or if you've done something related to this, as you said, Lincoln already had a, the Girls Who Code here first, um, or anything you've done at your library, share with what you've done. Share yeah, that. I'd love to hear. Um, we do just have some comments. Congratulations on your wonderful programs. And then someone else said, thank you. This is so helpful. We have been wanting to find out more about how to start a program like this, but it seemed like a daunting task. Um, now I think we'll begin to explore it because of you know learning about these things. Thanks so much for the info. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to comment too. I was I've been saving a lot of the links and things that Marvel Mer um, mentioned throughout the show into our delicious account, so you didn't have to worry about scrolling those down. Those of you that attend the show regularly you know those will be available. So um, all the different websites you've mentioned. Now all those things, the PDFs. I'm not going to save those. We'll just give you those PDFs as part of the show. Um, information afterwards, but a lot of these pages and websites and, and groups are out there. Um, and as I was looking at the Hour of Code video, getting that, um, and it did talk about something coming up, you know, to, we would love to get everyone together. Specifically, the the um, event they're talking about is actually this December. They've done mm -hmm. it every year for uh -huh. a few years every now. Every December. Every December. Um, so if you're looking to actually um, participate in something, that's a worldwide event that everyone, other groups out there will be doing at the same time. It's um, it says in the description of that video, which you might not have seen when we just showing the full screen video there. Um, they're specifically being organized for the week of December fifth through eleventh this 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 December twenty sixteen, and it's part of the um, Computer Science Education Week, which I gave a link to that as well. I added so um, that would be something potentially to work for towards as maybe your first you know, uh, foray into this is that this is a specific event coming up this December and you could start getting organized to participate in it right now. You know, and if you're not familiar with Hour of Code, it's a, um, essentially sort of a drag and drop um, um, environment that you're in. And so it's um, um, the, 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 Coding is sort of embedded in the in the in the drag and drop, and so it's a really interesting and fun way um, uh, to get involved. And it took me longer than an hour to get through everything. I have to admit, um, I wasn't as quick as some of the young people, but it is a really engaging and fun uh, activity. Um, one last thing I forgot to mention: um, if you've gotten the latest American Libraries magazine, there's a, an article about coding that I would. Um, um, recommend that you go to, and they they actually mention a site called connectory.org. Um, I tried to load that, and actually my um, library system blocked it, so I couldn't provide oh. the link. But connectory.org is also one of those sites that they mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I'm not familiar with it myself, but I wanted to uh, um, put that out there. If you see that article in American Library, in the most recent American Libraries, um, they'll mention that site. Yeah, I'll have to look for that because I just kind of Googled it and I got a, this domain is available, but I may not be spelling it correctly. Oh, okay. You'll have to see. Yeah, look to the, look in American Library, see what they send you to. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, do you have a, uh, another question here, which is so slightly off topic, but not really. Um, we talked about STEM and STEAM, but apparently now, and I actually Googled myself, it's been a couple of years, there's now STREAM. We're mm -hmm. adding the R for reading oh. for the same reason that the A was added for arts, basically spending everything. And when, is this a trend or just a regional thing? Um, well, I don't. I just did a Google search for STEM stream and found some articles actually back in 2014 from um, Huffington Post, um, International Innovation, uh, Ed Webb talking about is that something new that needs to be done? And then someone else saying, forget the acronyms and just teach the stuff. Don't worry about what the acronym <laughs> is. But yeah, just teach all the things, <laughs> basically. I mean, it is nice, though, to get the focus I, I'm originally on the STEM, that that was something, all of those scientific-related things that was 
maybe not getting enough of a focus or people wanted to say, you know, try this, you know, focus on these things. Um, so I guess it is a new thing. Have you heard anything about that? I haven't heard R? about that, but thank you no. for, for, I love learning something new. So yeah. this is something I'll investigate and I can add to my article bibliography. Um, this article talks about that in 20, 2006 was when the term STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, came out. Um, and then adding A and R for reading. Um, I think a lot of the concept, I guess, is just from, I'm just scanning this, what I've found here, is the idea that when you're focusing on other things, it makes people potentially think that, other areas are not as important anymore. And the idea is that the reading is still an important skill as well. Yeah, it is. So um, I don't know if that'll be. I have not heard about. Um, oh, <laughs> she's just right. She says, I found that grant funders often appreciate acronyms, though. It makes it does. I oh. yeah, can make it seem um, because it's an official that. thing exactly. that exists. It's not just that this library organization has made up some idea what they want to do, that it's an actual uh, yeah. <laughs> and whatever whatever so. gets you the support that you need, I'm mm -hmm. all for it. Oh, and here's a quote. Someone says, a stream, science and technology interpreted through engineering and the arts, conveyed through reading and writing, all based in elements of mathematics. Oh. That's some sort of thing that is connected in here. So. Wow. But it is, yeah, a more recent um, development in that era, area. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. Definitely something to look into. Oh, and then I'll, I'll put a link to that article, yes, into the show notes. Yeah, it's one that I just happened to find, yeah. Um, and this is an article that was on Huffington Post by a, um, a principal at an elementary school. Hmm. So, um, Where was he? Does it, does it say? Oh, no. Uh, elementary principal, author, national presenter is just a little quickie blurb. Um, mm -hmm. Rob Furman, and we know him. He's got a link to his Twitter account here. Let's see. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, Wondered if he was from Arkansas. Oh, right, because mm -hmm. they're ahead of the. Um, let's see. Let's find out. Where's like? Who are you? He's, he's he does a lot of speaking and stuff on this topic, so I get his a lot of his information seems to be more. I, I talk about these things. Uh, oh, Pittsburgh, sorry, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, there okay. it is, right on his Twitter account. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so he's out of Pennsylvania, but he's available to talk. But anyway, so he does this as a thing. It's not just some random person who put up an opinion piece. It looks like he's <laughs> actually involved in researching these kinds of things. So, all right. Um, Anybody else have any other questions? Um, let's see here. Rosella, you had your hand up. Did you want to um, say something? I've unmuted you if you have a microphone. I'm not sure if that's why you had your hand up. No. Yeah. All right. No problem. Uh, I wasn't sure. All right, um, or a little after 11 o'clock, so I think it's about time to wrap it up for our hour here this morning. Um, thank you very much, Marvel. This was great. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, as I said, we've had various um, the various shows on Encompass Live about all these different new technology things coming out, um, maker spaces, maker camps, D, uh, 3D printing, robotics, whatever, and there's just so many different ways to come at it, and I'm glad we, and we haven't done I've heard about the Girls of Code Club for a while, yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad we finally had that you were able to come on and tell us more about it from you know that point of view and helping people get ideas about how to run you know get these going in your um, libraries. So um, thank you very much and thank you very much everyone for attend for attending out there. Um, the show um, is being recorded at the moment um, and it will be available on our um, website most likely later this afternoon. Um, as long as um, I'm mean, I'm pretty quick getting things processed and up there. Um, I'm at the mercy of YouTube and how they how long it takes them to get things uh, uh, processed through their system. But um, later this afternoon it should be available. I'll send you all an email when it is um, ready to be viewed. 
and um, let's see, I'll close that off here. That's there. Let's see. No, it doesn't get down here. There we go. Um, and it will be available on our website, which I'll show you right now. This is the Library Commission's website, but if you also just type in Encompass Live, so far in the world, we are the only thing that's called that, so when you Google it, you find us. Um, um, so this is Encompass Live website, our upcoming shows, but right here underneath the upcoming shows is a list to our archives. And that's where this one will be record, um, posted. Here's last week's, which was about maker camps. There you go. Cool. <laughs> um, of like the recording on our YouTube channel, um, Marvel's uh, PowerPoint presentation, and the PDFs will be in there in our SlideShare account. Any links I grabbed will be on our Delicious account here. So you have all that collected into one space where you can watch it later, um, share with anyone else you might think may be um, interested in um, the topic. So um, that will be later today. Um, hopefully you'll join us for one of our other shows we have coming up. Next week our topic is the story of Trading Stories, a Native American film festival. Um, this is an event that's been done now in uh, western Nebraska at Shadron Public Library. This is their third event where they do um, well, Native American Film Festival. Kind of self-explanatory there, isn't it? Um, it's a multi-day event. Um, I think it's about, oh, it says they're five days, so it's a huge event, actually, um, where they, the actual the library itself, hosts this event with um, programs and um, presentations and things. And this year is actually premiere of a new um, documentary, um, Medicine Woman, which will actually be on PBS. Um, later this year, uh, so that was where it was premiered, um, was at their um, film festival. So um, Rosella Tesh, who's actually watching today's show, hi Rosella, <laughs> um, she will be with us um, next week remotely to talk about this um, event that they've been doing for the last couple of years. Let me just see if we have anything here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I just took a second to last. Oh. <laughs> Hey, all right. So I hope you join us for that show, um, next week's show and any of our other ones we have coming up. Um, we I'm always adding new new topics to the schedule. As you can see, I've got the first three weeks of September booked, and I'm working on something for the last week. So keep your eyes open when I get it finalized. It'll be up there, um, and then as you know, the future months as well. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, we've got a link here. Click over there and give us a like. Um, you'll get notifications of when new shows are coming up, when recordings are available. Well, this is actually logged into somebody's account. Cool. Um, here you see this morning I did a little reminder to log in right now to this week's show. Um, people can come in on the fly. So if you're big on Facebook, to do um, give us a like over there and um, we'll keep up with the show that way. Get back to this page. There we go. All right. Other than that, that wraps it up for this week's session. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. coming down and Appreciate joining it. us this morning. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>